really happy to be here. This has been awesome so far. I have the pleasure of introducing our next topic, and that is thinking like an AI native. I'm going to reintroduce and welcome back to the stage uh, Mr. Hari Aburi and Dr. Effie Pilarnio. And I'd also like to introduce uh, Mr. Yanis uh, Pinarias. Yanis comes from, uh, to us from Microsoft. Yanis is part of the Microsoft Digital Group. He's a principal design lead and part of the AI Center of Excellence. Panelists, I'll leave you to it. So we are delighted uh, to discuss our, our chapter, which is really one of those blurs that um, will blow your mind, uh, I, I believe. Let me start with um, um, just uh, reminding ourselves that business transformation is one of those constants. And, um, you know, some businesses uh, are, I think most businesses are on that journey. For some of them, it is a roller coaster. In any case, this is a moving target. But we think it is important to take a pulse of what, it go, uh, what is going on right now. And the way we see the world, there are four archetypes, types of businesses that are important. The first one is what we call a traditional business. And a traditional business might be using modern tools, might be using grandpa tools, but what they are lacking is a deep customer-centric mindset and a data-driven mindset, which is exactly what is typical to a digitally native uh, business. That archetype has been born in the last, I would say, two decades and has given birth to the so-called experience economy that most of us uh, are familiar with. Then we have another breed, another archetype, which is the blockchain native businesses. These, you know, they are digital, but they're very different in many ways, both in the, the types of tools they use, but mainly uh, the, the way they exchange uh, value and the way they um, govern uh, the processes. And then there's the last one, the AI-native archetype of businesses that are blurs. Um, they're not born yet, and these are the ones that are very interesting to us and we discuss in our chapter uh, because we believe that right now we only have companies that are using AI tools, but not really in, in um, the breadth and depth that we think that AI native businesses will be using them. And as a result of this four archetypes and the evolution, the business is now caught in multiple stages of transformation. So we still have many traditional businesses trying to understand and adopt a digital business model. So we have a number of old companies still trying to do that. We have digital natives, Airbnbs, Ubers of the world, that were actually born digital, but then things like cloud and everything else came in. So the tech stack looks very different, the business model looks very different. So even for digital native companies, they still are going through a next level of transformation. Now, layering all of this, we now have what we think is an AI-first business model thinking. The way I would describe it is, Imagine if you're a company that you're working for today, or imagine companies like Unilever, Coca-Cola that we know, right? Or even Airbnbs, et cetera, or Amazon, for example. What if these companies were born in 2030? What would be different, knowing everything that we know today and things that we don't know tomorrow? So the complexity of transformation has just exponentially increased, and you have to have a mindset to be able to handle multiple loops of transformation at the same time. So transformation is not a singularity, it's not linear. Uh, you will, it's almost like having a bifocal vision. You got to be able to see 100 things at the same time. Uh, you got to have uh, 
the ability to multiply your hands and legs and brains and everything else. So you're handling really complex multiple loops of transformation and change. And having said that, we still need some type of framework to understand this level of complexity that is uh, unfolding in front of us. So the way we, we have developed our framework and are looking at it is in three areas. When we look at an AI native business, we look at the customer area, the enterprise area, and then the ecosystem area. We believe that those cover the breadth so, and enable us to uh, look at how we can guide you in use cases for AI native businesses. And those three application areas, if I may use the word loosely, we cut across those three areas horizontally with five dimensions on how you could look at AI native businesses. In very simple way, this should help you think through all the possible use cases of AI across customer, enterprise, and ecosystem. We, we looked at everything that FinTech did to, to the digital world. We looked at what every single evolution of technology has done for disruption. And we believe that those five dimensions will critically drive uh, how your business will look at adoption of AI. And, and very quickly, you know, I know you can read it at the back, but those five dimensions are you see discovery, design, decision, dexterity, and uh, deduction, right? So, and we'll try and give you very quick examples across. Obviously, we won't cover each one of it, but we'll give you a flavor of what it means uh, so you understand the model. Yeah, this is in our book. We discuss more extensively all these nodes. So uh, just now we'll give you some examples, and let me start with... Um, an interesting one in the enterprise area at the discovery phase, a great example that some of you might be familiar with, which is really in the drug industry in research and development from the early days of the advancements in AI of these large language models, we saw real use cases where drug discovery has been, at the time for drug discovery has collapsed from, um, I mean, we have examples of companies like Accentia, which is a, a drug development and research company, and they have developed already drugs with the help of AI that are in um, human clinical uh, trials, and the time is like, you know, uh, molecules that can pro be produced in five minutes and uh, previously in traditional ways it would take a year. But it's not only the time that is much faster, it's not only the cost that is reduced through these applications, it's also that the success rate after the, the research for the drug molecules has increased from about 50% to 90%. So that's a great example in the enterprise discovery area. Yeah, and I want to pick up a very interesting example uh, for design and at the customer application area. All of you know IKEA. Uh, IKEA has gone all in with Gen I on customer service, and they've done a good job of intuitiveness and in how the customers are served. Uh, fair amount of personalization and detailing. As a result, there was a large amount of customer service workforce that was becoming redundant. However, when you think through the design aspect of this, and, and Yanis will actually has a very interesting approach on applying design as a principle in, in adoption of AI, they retooled all this workforce with AI tools as a design lab. So if you went to IKEA and say, this is the square foot of my house, you send them pictures, they use AI. They're almost like a home decor, home layout consultants using AI. So the same customer work for service workforce now uses Gen AI for not just customer service, but are actually your home um, layout consultants recommending how you can optimize and make your house look good. And it's a great example uh, of application for the customer using design as a key principle. So let me offer you a, a different example in the um, enterprise area at the strategic, strategic decision uh, level. 
Uh, and, and I'll refer to a company that is um, based in Luxembourg. It's a family-run conglomerate. Uh, they have um, businesses in, in the restaurant sector, in the coffee business. Uh, they, they, under them, there's brands like um, Dr. Pepper and Caribou and so on. And in 2020, this company called Jab they decided to go into pet clinics. And actually in 2023, they even acquired an insurance, a pet insurance uh, company successfully. Now, you might ask, you know, what's the relationship of coffee and restaurants and, and pets? And maybe we can say, you know, that coffee lovers wouldn't have a morning walk without their coffee. and. Uh, pet lovers wouldn't have a morning walk without their pet. Maybe there's that similarity. But imagine if you're using AI to research um, disruptive strategies of this nature to, for your business. So this is an area that there's a lot of potential and a blur with uh, a lot of opportunities. Uh, and one more, more example is around uh, dexterity and rapid integrations. I'm sure all of you heard of Shopify. Shopify has one of the most powerful creative developer ecosystems. And one of the interesting principles of Shopify is unless the developers and their apps actually make little about a million dollars, there are no developer fees. What that has done is it's really spurred Shopify into this very powerful, flexible, uh, SaaS business model, if you may. But what is underneath all of that is integrations. They are literally able to drive integrations into any possible scenario that you can have, any technology framework that you can have. What they're now doing is that if I, as a user, want to set up a Shopify storefront, knowing what type of business, the system is learning what type of business I'm trying to set up. And it's already automatically listing up the integrations I need to have to be successful. Right, so it's, it's brilliant in terms of the monetization effect. In fact, uh, I know, and we have Sri who's gonna come in later, he's like our tech guru. Uh, Alan, you too, uh, so just not miss out, but. Uh, so really you'll understand the monetization of the APIs, et cetera, using AI, uh, and Shopify is on the front of it. And the last example um, is in the area of uh, customers and um, the deduction, looking at the personalization that AI can offer. Great example is Duolingo, you know, the big company to learn uh, foreign languages. And they've launched two AI powerful capabilities. One is called uh, Explain My Answer, where, um, you know, if you're uh, speaking to Duolingo and you make a mistake, then explain my answer will give you feedback why, what is the mistake so you understand your mistake. And then the next capability is role playing. The chatbot will play a role, you'll be in conversation with the chatbot, so it's an interactive capability. Combine that with the explanation, it's, it's the next level of personalization or intelligence as I like to think of it. And you know the interesting thing about AI is the clock still tells that we're out of time because it started late. I'm hoping I get some grace time uh, <laughs> because Yanis still has to go. Uh, so please, you know, moderators, be kind. Uh, we, we have a couple of quick points to close up before we pass it. The, the fundamental challenge of professionals and leaders is to break the linearity of thinking. The way I would explain it is all of you have Siri and Alexa. It is digital, it's highly sophisticated, but it's linear. It cannot turn off the light and open the door at the same time, it needs two commands. Now with Apple AI announcement, of course they made a very snazzy ad, it has to still work, right? So the linearity continues to be a challenge. So this is not a linear model, we don't recommend you follow vertically or horizontally. We created those dimensions so you can actually understand the nuances of how AI would get applied to your business across 
uh, the three application areas. I think. Yeah, I think it's extremely important to understand that all these nodes are interconnected. So again, don't look at this as a five by three uh, linear uh, model. It, it's really an invitation to explore combinations and create use cases through combinations and really launch what we like to think of as an AI factory of, of use cases from these different combinations. Yanis? Yanis. Uh, yes. And, and don't pay attention to that so clock. You, you have plus five because it was So back. do we have five minutes, including the moderator? Really? You, you, no. You do, you do it. About five minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Jake has yeah. agreed. I see Jake nodding. And uh, first of all, thank you, Effie and Harry, for inviting me here. For some context, um, I'm a design manager inside Microsoft Digital. And in fact, when, when Harry and Effie invited me to look into this framework and kind of like reflect on it, I found very similarities with similar frameworks what we are developing in design. And when I say design in the broader sense, because at Microsoft, when we think about design systems, it's a product. We think about it like a product that many, need, many roles need to use from researchers to designers to engineers to PMs. It's a multidisciplinary system and we see it as a product. And as such, my first thing, my first reflection was that like, how do we apply, how do I learn about this, pro uh, this framework, right? And, and being a program, a program, a, a product, how do we go from theory to the practice? Um, like I was, at, I was thinking each one of these dimensions needs a series of principles for me to understand and so that I can apply it. I fully agree that it's not a linear system. In fact, my design and engineering brain immediately wanted to disassemble your framework because I wanted to understand how did you put it together, right? Because in fact, I don't believe it's linear or structured. And if you think even more within the context of AI, which is non-deterministic, like in, UX, in AI UX, which is what I'm doing these days, is that like all designers thinking, well, how are we going to design UX now? It's non-deterministic. Like, I mean, I used to make a, a design flow. Now the flow is decided by the LLM behind. And so I was kind of like struggling to, between the hierarchy and the structure of the framework, but the reality will be that it's not like this. And I think in that gap, that's where the innovation is. That's where we need to involve, to figure out or invent the tools that will go from a theory to the practice because eventually every framework needs to be practical. Similarly, as we develop, for example, design frameworks at Microsoft, but then our end users, in fact, engineering organizations, hundreds and thousands of people are telling us, I don't need theory, I need Give me the tools, give me the practice, give me the playbooks, give me the guidelines, the code, the research tools, the accessibility tools in order for this system to deliver the products that we're delivering for millions of customers. So I think the opportunities are like, how do we go from a framework and the theory to business, the businesses getting, applying that framework. Um, some other things, uh, I remember like there was like this, this you talked about this galactic scale, uh, AI has this ability to extrapolate and accelerate things at scale, which is beyond the human scale. We see this in many other disciplines, including design and PMs, the researchers at Microsoft. We don't have the answers, but what we know is that like, we will need tools. Tools that connect the human world with the algorithmic world, because at the end, AI is a, is a world of machines, right? It's not a human world. And we talk always about AI, but, and why, why I think designers are very important. Not designers like me, I mean design thinkers. Every, everyone can be a design thinker. Any of you can be a design thinker. Why? Because humans are, in the, are we are at the intersection of the humanity, the human world, and the machine world, right? And so we should keep in mind that. And so we see this collapse. AI is collapsing that space, but, but we are setting, we are in the middle actually, and we need to guide that, that uh, that trans transformation. And one interesting thought to close also was like, if it's not like this, as a rational greed, this, this framework, and if it has an elastic or non-deterministic nature, does it mean it needs to be developed as an AI product, as an AI system itself? I see this framework as an entity, an AI entity, as a large language model. Can you put this knowledge from the book, from the framework, from the tools, that middle space that we decided, like from theory to practice, there's a lot to, do, to, to actually invent inside that space. Can we take that middle space, which is what makes it real, 
and embedded into an AI offering and then becomes a product. So as a, as a small company or a large company or a practitioner, I can use it because we are working with these tools these days, right? And so if, I'm, if I need to do something about design, about research and so on, and I want to use your framework, can I use it like with, you know, as a co-pilot? Could it be something like that? Thank you. Uh, yeah. I'm ha first of all, I'm happy you didn't deconstruct the model. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jake, uh, all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Giannis, I actually did a uh, design thinking training through Microsoft uh, maybe a couple of years back. And it was it was excellent. So highly recommend that if, uh, if you all haven't. And then transformation is not linear. Can I use that, Hari? Am I allowed to use that? Oh, that's wonderful. Love that. Um, and sometimes a roller coaster. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right, right. Uh, thank you all very, very much. Uh, I would like to open it up to uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, oh, yes. This is our go-to. I should have just started over here. Thank you so much. Very, very informative session. Uh, where is AI governance and AI regulation uh, right now in comparison to the AI enhanced capabilities is growing? I'll pass it to the gentleman on my right. <laughs> okay, your question is that like, where is uh, AI regulation? Governance. A governance, AI ethics, etc. cetera. Um, well, if we look at that, at the framework that has discovery, design, decision, dexterity, deduction, it should be everywhere, essentially. There should be an underlying, you know, regulatory framework for AI and ethics, etc. But it varies based on, on the area, right? If this, is, if this framework was applied around in the space of healthcare, obviously there will be something relevant in that space. If it's in a consumer space, or if it is in a legal space, in HR, uh, in engineering, in fintech, etc. Um, and maybe this, this brings an interesting thought, like whether it has to be part of the framework, the evolution of this framework. Perhaps you need to include that as well. I, I re th this framework is very, um, it's industry independent. And, you know, healthcare or financial services where I dwell, which are the most heavily regulated industries, naturally at every of these nodes, you have to be moving within um, that framework. And, you know, regulation is also a very live thing. It's not, you know, fixed. And we're actually already one of the very successful use cases in financial services, which has been using AI for a very long time and now is adopting the advancements in AI. It's in compliance, it's in fraud, very successful use cases, and in um, being able to use generative AI to read uh, and uh, compliance documents and be able to make sure, because there's many conflicts also, you know, across industries or across countries, across jurisdictions. So it's, it's built in, I think. Yeah. The, only, the only quick comment I would add is we approach it as as trying to get clarity for professionals and leaders. It's a business model centric point of view. It does not mean that governance is not important or, or it's uh, second or third in priority. But we wanted to help people deconstruct it yeah. and, and build a business case for themselves. And, and Sri and I were in Seattle earlier in March. Uh, we had about 15 senior leaders from credit unions in Microsoft Commons uh, and in all the half a day we spent with them, a little more than half a day, the technology issue didn't come up. You, many leaders are struggling to understand very specific use cases so that they can go to the board and make a case saying we need something in this direction for the company, right? So, so I think you got to have a very customer-centric, business-centric point of view first before you need to jump in. This is not a technology discussion if you ask me. So that's where I would leave it, thank you. This reminds me also a framework that we developed a year ago inside Microsoft Digital, because I'm part of the V team, a horizontal team, we call it AI Center of Excellence. And in fact, we had a similar diagram, but it was different, it had all the disciplines. But one, one lesson from there is that like, we made responsible AI a foundational layer. The way we framed it was that like, everything is encompassed by responsible AI. We start by responsible AI, and then we build the framework there on top of it. Excellent. 
One more question, or else we're going to pass it off. Yes, excellent. Yep. My question is for those of us in the business world who are in a traditional business setting and really trying to move our organizations forward, how do you encourage people, especially leaders who've been kind of in this old management theory, how do you encourage them to be open to this transformation so that you can actually do the work of transforming your enterprise? You know, uh, one of the projects we did a couple of years ago is with uh, Boston Scientific. We have Kausik here, who is ex-HR leader from Boston Scientific, and we worked with a chief digital officer on a short capability project. She actually said a very interesting statement. She said, an education-first approach accelerates change much faster. And I think, I, I don't remember who said it earlier. Uh, Dean Williamson said it, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. You only find it difficult or you're only afraid of something because nobody has explained it to you or you're living in a blur, right? So, so I think that, that's the way I would sum it. I think we have a responsibility to immerse ourselves in it, find explainability of change, so people can come on board at it. If you hold them straight away and throw it at their face, I think, I think we're going to have more resistance. But having said that, and I have a little bit of HR background, and I know Laura you, you, you there, some leaders just won't change, right? So that's where you need automation, I guess. So. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Giannis? Also, ac activating a culture of learning, the way we do it at Microsoft, obviously we have our CEO, that's, you know, there's like been a slogan, like we learn all the time. But inside Microsoft Digital, we have put together a program of a cal cultural transformation and from an AI angle and AI learning. So we have developed all of these programs with badges that we share in LinkedIn and every single employee is encouraged to go and learn and experiment, every single, every single one. It's even back in, baked in our commitments, you know, the reviews and annual reviews. Every single person is learning inside Microsoft. Excellent. Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you.